Exodus chapter number 20. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 19. The Bible says, And they, talking about the children of Israel, said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, it shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Now, a lot of people know the beginning of this chapter for God gave Moses Ten Commandments. What we call Ten Commandments. There's more than ten, but they grouped them together to get the nice round number of ten. I don't know why, but everybody knows that part. Okay, We know, a lot of people know the story beforehand, which is God leading Israel out of Egypt, been in captivity for some 400 years. Okay, then afterwards everybody knows about you know Moses coming down the mountain throwing down the tablets okay a lot of people we know the highlights right but we forget the stuff that all oh, that was important well according to God it's all important that's why every verse is in your Bible so Moses okay verse number 19 Moses had come down the mountain okay because in the beginning of the chapter he received the Ten Commandments Okay, he has come down to Mount, and he's headed back. Well, you say, why is he headed back if he got the Ten Commandments? Because God gave Moses over 600 laws and commandments that is what collectively, when you read the New Testament and the Apostle Paul's talking about the law, right, how this captive, we were under bondage in the law. He's talking about all them 600 and some odd laws that God had given Moses. Okay, and there were a whole bunch of them. He said you weren't allowed to wear blended fabrics or mixed fabrics. Okay, he said you had to dress a certain way, that you had to walk a certain way, had to eat a certain way, had to live a certain way. And if you couldn't fulfill every jot and tittle of the law, use the sinner. That's why the New Testament, the law was the forerunner, our schoolmaster, to show us that we needed a Savior. Okay? So, verse number 19, Moses fixing the head up. They've already heard 10, and they're saying, Moses... Don't let God talk with us because we're going to die. Right? They had enough common sense to realize that God was mightier than they were. Okay, but they misunderstood. Later on, God tells Moses that no man could see his face and live. Didn't say anything about hearing his voice. Okay, it said that we could see the glory of God. He said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock of you. And then as I pass by, you could see my glory. He said, no man could see me and live. But it said nothing about what, you know, hearing God. You'll find all throughout the Bible, God talking to people. If no man could hear God and live, everybody that Jesus talked to would have died. And in all seriousness. Right? Well, they say, Moses, we'll deal with you. Well, we'll listen as long as you want to talk and as, you know, sweaty and as you know much spitting and hollering and preaching you want to do we'll listen to you Moses but don't let God talk with us right? there's a whole bunch of people all across the country all across the world they're going to sit down and they're willing to listen to a preacher but they're never willing to listen to God right? that's, all, that's message number one Okay, we're not going to teach on that but that was the first thought I had and God said nope we ain't teaching on that so we're going to gloss over that Right, but there's a whole different scenario when God gets a hold of you and starts speaking to you. They're saying, we don't want to come face to face with the voice of the Holy One. Why? Because that means they'd have had to make a decision. Now you go and study it out after Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, all those that had just, you know, participated in idolatry and a whole bunch of wickedness, what happened to them? Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? And the people that weren't died. So these people know if God starts talking to us, we're going to have to make a decision, and it's going to be life or death. But we can handle Moses. 
Well, Moses wanted to kill them all anyway when he came down. He, he begged God not to kill them on the mountain, and then when he came down the mountain, he wanted to kill them. He said, Lord, just wipe them all off the map. Get what? We can't, got places to go, can't stay there. Verse number 20, Moses said unto the people, fear not. In other words, don't be afraid. It's just for God has come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that you said not. So some Bible correctors may try to tell you that this is a contradiction because Moses tells them to fear not but then says that God's come so that his fear will be before their faces. Two different versions of the word fear. First part, fear not. In other words, don't be afraid. God's not going to kill you. God, everything that God's doing up there is for your betterment, not for your hurt. And he says, but he's come to show his presence, right? His very voice, there was thunderings and lightnings that shook the whole mountain. Even the animals were too afraid to, you know, they had enough common sense that God's on that mountain. We're going to go to a different mountain. That's holy ground. Well, these people start hearing all these things. God's not doing that so that you'll be afraid of him. God's doing that so that you will reverence him. That his fear or his reverence will be... Our God isn't just some statue in a hall over there in Egypt. right? Our God isn't one that has ears but cannot hear and has eyes but cannot see. No, our God is the I Am. Isn't that what God told Moses from the burning bush to go tell Israel that I Am sent me? Because he's the God that lives. He says he made his presence, his power, and his majesty known so that they would remember it. And that their reverence for God, that's the thing that keeps you from sinning. Notice what it says. God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. You know when somebody starts sinning, Brother Ron? It's when they don't reverence God anymore. You can be afraid of God, but still sin. There's a whole lot of people out there in the world that know better. They know that God's judgment's going to come one day, but yet they still live the way that they want to live. But when you have that reverence of God before your face, when you remember what the Bible says God is, who God's been in your life, right, that He's still that same God today, then you start having an appreciation and reverence for the thing. That's when you don't sin. Because reverence brings about love. First off, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. That's why you can still reverence God and not have fear in your heart. No contradiction, anyway. But, also the Bible says that if you, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love him, you'll reverence him. And if you reverence him, you'll love him. Because if you respect God, you start studying God, you want to devote yourself to God, you find that he's altogether lovely. If you start reverencing who he is, you're going to find out he is love. And it's real hard not to love the one that is love. Love will cast out all the fear of, well, what's going to happen what's, if we do this? No. Don't have to doubt. Don't have to cast, you know, lots to see, well, is God going to be happy with us today or strike us down with lightning? No. It says, the fear or the reverence of God would be before your face. That ye sin not. God doesn't want you to be scared of him. God wants you to love and reverence him. And it's that reverence, that admission that he is all holy, all powerful, all knowing, and all present, that he knows better than us. That's what keeps us on the straight and narrow. It's only by the grace of God that he gave us enough understanding to realize how great and how holy and how majestic our God is that we can comprehend what is right and wrong let alone that he'd give us the ability to go out and live it well verse number 21 even after that Moses said fear not God's doing this for you guys as betterment he's doing this so that the reverence of God can be before your faces that you sin not and what it says and the people stood afar off didn't say that they stood. Didn't say that they drew near. Wherever they were, they went further away and then stood there. Even after hearing, no, that God loves you. And God's not angry. Just when God shows up, things that aren't holy can't stand to be around God no more. 
and the mountain's trying to run away from him. But God's holding it there in its place because that's where he said that he wants to meet us. So I'm going to go up there and I'm going to talk to God and God's going to tell me what's best for you. And then they still ran away. Now, if you stand afar, you can see things that are afar off. I'm convinced that they could still see the mountain. They didn't run far enough away where they couldn't see what was going on on top of that mountain. But you'll find the first time Moses went up the mountain, the people down said, no man can go up on top of that mountain and live. Moses is dead, so let's make our own God that we could serve and worship out here in the wilderness. That way you say, well, that's kind of foolish. I don't know what was going on on top of this mountain. The carnal man is easily scared. Right? They had their gender reveal party last Sunday. They let them poppers off. Their dog chief, gone. I knew it was going to happen. As soon as it went pop, chief was out. Right? Chief almost ran through a glass door trying to get inside. He stopped himself just in the nick of time. But he was like, oh, that door's closed. But I mean, he was trying to get back inside. That, that's how your carnal man gets when God shows up. It wants to get out. Right? It feels the presence of the Holy Ghost. What's going to happen? It, your flesh wants to get out of there. Because your flesh knows that this word's a sharp two-edged sword. It's going to divide what God approves of and what God doesn't approve of. And your flesh knows that God doesn't approve of the flesh. Doesn't approve of the carnal. Doesn't approve of the worldly. Doesn't approve of what we were conceived and born into. That's why we had to have a Savior. Well, the carnal side of the Israelites said, we're getting as far away from here as we can. For all I know, it looked like a war zone up on top of that mountain from the outside. But it may have made sense to the eyes and the ears and the flesh to say, we might just want to take a step back. Okay, if I'm walking down the road and it says, warning, like if you go down to Fort Knox where they got all them tanks, like ballistics testing for tanks, don't go past this fence. I'm going to stay, it says, don't go past this fence. But me being me, I'm going to get afar off from the fence because I know dangerous things are on the other side it's just good enough to steer clear of it I don't want a ricochet catching me right? it may have made sense to the carnal man to do that but it says they stood afar off and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was right? two thoughts don't have time we just turn in topsoil right here first thought you ever realize that sometimes you got to go to the darkest places in your life to get to where God is. Where'd Moses have to draw to? Into the darkness. Right? We want all sunshine and roses and rainbows. right? What if God has to get you deep down into a valley in order to see where God truly is, where he's manifested himself? He's there waiting on you. But when you get there, the presence of God's bigger, it's more real than it's ever been in your life. Where did God take Elijah after the juniper tree? Took him to a cave. You know what caves are? Dark. And what did he hear in the cave? He found that God wasn't in the wind, wasn't in the fire. He was in a still small voice. He got to a dark place and guess what happened? God showed up and talked to him. Now, well, second thought. Okay, Really, I wanted to title the lesson this, but then we ended up not covering this, Brother Ron. I wanted to call it Into the Thick of It. Because <laughs> where did Moses go? It says... Right, that Moses drew near unto the thick darkness. It wasn't just dark; it's thick too. That you you know when it's hot, but there's a difference between hot and when the hot gets thick. That's called humid. That's one thing for things to be dark in your life. That like, Lord, it's pretty dark. It's another thing when it gets thick. What's that? That's burdens. That's the cares of this world. That's the cares of this flesh. That's you trying to bear one another's burdens all while you know you need somebody to help bear your burdens. That's why you're trying to do everything that you can and you're about this far away from just losing it. But it's dark. The only light you got is a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. We've taught on that before. A lamp under your feet means you can see where you're standing. And a light under your path means you know where you ought to go. But a lot of times, that thing in the middle, that's called faith. God gave us to see where we are and where we need to be, but we step out on faith. We live by faith. 
So that thick darkness, we know where we're headed. And I know where I'm at. And I know that God's still the same. God told me to get there. That means it's for my best. This process, this hardness, this darkness, this thickness is for me to become a better Christian. But it doesn't make the thickness any less thick. Moses had to hike up a mountain to get to where God was. Then he had to come down the mountain. He didn't get to take a rest. What did he have to do? He had to preach what God just gave to him to those people. And then guess what happened? He went back up and he came back down. Every time he had to go through the thick darkness. Right? Just because it's dark, right, doesn't mean that we're without light, but just because it's dark doesn't mean, you know, I don't know if you guys are the same way. I'm lazy. I don't like turning on the lights when I get out of bed if I have to because that means I'm going to have to go turn the lights off before I can get back and just cut out the middleman. Right? It's not a thick darkness. I'm free to move around and do what I want until I find the corner of the bedpost with my pinky toe and then it's a bad idea. Right? Thick darkness is where it's so dark you're afraid to move. You're afraid to breathe. And it's in those moments you find out, one, how strong your faith can be because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But it's also where you find that the arm of flesh will fail you, but yet his strength is made perfect in weakness. It's through the thickness that you find out how strong God really is. Because the darkness is darker than I can shine a light into. The only light that I can see by is what he gave me. It's not something that I came up with. The thickness is so thick that I can't get through it. But yet God says he'd make a path. I mean, we just sang about it. The road may be steep, but yet I see his footprints all the way. He's already tread the road that he told us to follow. He didn't say it'd be an easy road, but he did say that he'd be there with us every step of the way. Uh, well, look with me down in verse number 22. Lord said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering, and thy peace offering, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Now keep in mind, Israel just came out of Egypt, a very opulent society. Their slaves had gold earrings. That's how rich Egypt was. Go and study it. It says that the Israelites broke off the gold in their ears to make that golden calf, that idol. Those earrings were the things that marked them as slaves. And they were permanent. That's why they had to break them out of their ear. Right? But when the slaves have gold earrings, it's an opulent society. Okay? They had temples to this day that still the stone is still around that they built to the best of their abilities. That's what the pyramids were. They thought that the pharaohs were gods and that if they didn't have a very nice you know, burial place that they wouldn't reincarnate into the next pharaoh and that you know, chaos would break out. Okay, well... After the, you know, the one guy said, well, give me a nice shiny one. The other guy said, make mine bigger and bigger, and then eventually you get pyramids. Okay, well, they were all about opulence. They were about artwork. They were about intellect. Everywhere you went, if it was dedicated to one of the Egyptians' gods, there was gold, there was silver, there were great edifices. There were things to show that they respected and that they cared about what was inside of that building, even if it was useless, powerless in the long run. By the way, go study all the plagues of Egypt. Each one of them attacked one of Egypt's major gods to show that they had no power when compared to God. But yet those things which they thought had power, what they do? They built great buildings to them. They built gold and silver off altars and bowls and pots to minister to certain things within those buildings that the priests could use. And here God is on top of a mountain talking to Moses about the children of Israel, and this is what he tells them. First off, he says, no idols. 
Okay? Don't have time to get into that. Been a long time. I think it's still on YouTube unless Brother Randy got tired of it and took it down. But if you want all that, it's been about a decade, but go listen to that one that I preached one time on casting out the graven image. We deal with all the idolatry and the silver and the gold and everything else. Don't have time. Okay, I think that one took me about an hour and ten when I did that one, Brother Randy. We got about 25 left. So, But the Lord said unto Moses, First off, you shall say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Keep in mind, they could have heard that God talked to them out of heaven. But they stood afar off. So what they see, they saw that God came down and talked to Moses. But they could have heard that God talked to them out of heaven. Just saying. What kept the Israelites away from the mountain? First off, anybody that was unclean and stepped on the mountain, they'd have died. They didn't want to get clean before they stepped on the mountain. But Moses wasn't there. Joshua went with them. What kept the rest of them from going? They didn't want to be there. They could have heard. But instead they saw. So, he says, You have seen that I talked to you out of heaven. You shall not make me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. He says, I don't want the silver, and I don't want the gold. He says, it's not going to cost you from your pocketbook. It's not going to cost you in, in, in apparel. It's not going to cost you in things that you give up in order to satisfy me. God says, I don't want your things. I want you. He said, I didn't lead the treasures of Egypt out of Egypt to be mine. God owns the cattle on a thousand hill, the gold in the hill, and all the gold that people done dug out of the hill. It's all his. He made it from nothing. God's not impressed with the gold and the silver and the fine artistry of man. He has for himself, okay, already prepared a place called heaven, right, that he made. You think you're going to outdo God's handiwork? And then we get a little glimpse of a place called new heaven and new earth, new Jerusalem, right? And that place, John says, he's going to prepare a place for us. And he promised that if he did, he's going to come and get us. And he says, but I don't have the right words to describe what it's going to be like. He says, it's got 12 foundations. One of them kind of looked like Jasper, but I don't know what it was. Because God made it, and he didn't tell me what he made it out of. But what do his eyes look like? Well, he's got eyes of flaming fire, but that don't do it justice. He's got hair white as wool, but wool's not white enough to describe his hair. Right? His visage, if I'd really seen it, I'd have died. We've already covered that. But he says, but the glimpse that I got, he's altogether lovely. So you really think God's impressed with silver and gold? No. By the way, God did lead all the riches of Egypt out with the children of Israel, but that's because they took all the, you know, God let them take all the riches with them. They walked out not just with the Israelites. They had the Israelites, they had all the cattle and all the, you know, livestock. They took all the fine clothing and the fine gold and fine jewelry. Pharaoh said, give it to them and get them out of here whatever it takes to stop these plagues. Then he changed his mind, and then God showed up with a pillar of fire and changed everything. What happened? Kept Pharaoh from getting to him, put a barrier between them, and then after Israel had safely crossed, he took that barrier away, and then he drowned Pharaoh and all of his armies in the Red Sea that he had just unparted. But he said, God gave them the riches, but he says, I don't want the riches. Those aren't what I desire from you. Now later you'll find that David desired to have a house for God that was the best that man can make. Not the best that God deserved, but the best that man could do. And then he stored up all the stores, and then you find that God comes around, and he gives Solomon the okay to go ahead and start building it. And they get the finest craftsmen. They get the finest woodworkers. They get the smartest guys to lay out the foundations and to hew the stones and bring them all in. And they do it to the best of their ability. But they knew that God wasn't going to be satisfied with silver and gold. They did that out of love because they wanted God to have the best house in all of Israel. They did it as a sign of devotion that, Lord, you have the first seat in Israel's lives. You have the best. You have our undevoted effort to provide you a place so that you can dwell among your people. That's why they did it. 
They did it as a sign of reverence, not out of fear. But here, God says, I don't want the silver. I don't want the gold. He didn't want the silver and the gold then. But you find that he showed up in a thick cloud. What happened? God showed up and it got real thick around there, so thick that the priest had to run out. Why do you think it was thick when Moses went up the mountain? Because God was there. It's not easy for man to approach God. you got to strive to do it. you got to overcome the flesh. you got to overcome fear. And you have to embrace that I'm going to get to where God is because I reverence Him and I fear Him. But I also love Him. But when God approved of that Solomon's temple, God didn't reside in that temple, but they knew that there was a place that they could go to and God would meet with them. You know why they knew that? Because of the verse that we just read. Notice. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. In other words... You know what God wanted? He wanted a dirt altar. Next two verses he says, if you want to, you can make one out of stone. He says, but you can't have hewn stone. You know that is? That means you knock everything off and make it square. Right? It's level, and then you build it out of nice, evenly shaped bricks. He says, nope, don't do that. The moment you touch it, you defile it. He says, don't touch this. Use the stones that I put in the ground. And use that to make an altar out of it. Do you know what God's impressed with? Things that God has done. What was the only sacrifice that could remove the sins of the world? That John said, I behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. You know what sacrifice that was? The one that God did. You know why God looks at you and can bless you today? Because God put on you a robe of righteousness that looks like Christ. You didn't put that robe on. You know who put that robe on? God did. That's why God's satisfied with the work. You know what God was impressed with? God was impressed with the dirt that he spoke out of nothing. You know what was satisfactory unto God? The rocks that he made and put into the ground. And actually he had put them in the ground twice when you're going to think about it. First he spoke everything into existence. Then he put them back in the ground after the flood with Noah. He moved them to the spot that they were when they found them. They put them right there for them to make an altar out of. They're going around and looking and thinking, man, I can't believe I found all these rocks right here. God can. He put them there. <laughs> he said, what are you saying, brother? God's telling us it's not about what you give up. It's about what God expects. If you reverence God, you'll go take a pile of dirt and shape it into an altar to sacrifice off of. If you reverence and respect the commandments of God, you'll go out and you'll find hewn stones. A lot of times you'll find that they use 12 stones. But in order to get an altar big enough out of 12, these are pretty big stones. But they make that altar. What's 12 in the Bible a symbol of? God's government. God's order. How many disciples? 12. How many tribes of Israel? 12. Right? That's God's government on earth is 12. Why do you think they used 12 stones? Because they wanted to, this is how God said we do business with them. God's government includes 12 stones that we sacrifice and make an altar out of. Now you go find, who was it? I think it's Naaman, that general. He comes in. He goes and he dips in the river. He said, if he'd have told you some hard thing, you'd have gone and done that. But he says, but he tells you to do an easy thing and you laugh at him. So he goes and does it. And he comes back and he gives all this, he offers to give all this gold and silver and everything to the man of God. The man of God says, I don't want none of that. You give God the glory for it. You go on back home. You find that Naaman takes with him, I think, 12 donkeys worth of dirt. Why is he taking dirt all the way back to where he came from to make an altar to God out of? He knew God wasn't impressed with the gold and silver. Man of God just turned it down. But he knew that he had a new God. He wasn't serving the gods of his people no more. And he wanted God's dirt to make an altar to God out of when he got back home. He didn't want his dirt. He wanted God's dirt. So he took God's dirt with him. 
Here, God says, really, you want to get down to business? You truly want to start meriting, or in their eyes, meriting the approval of God? God just winked at their ignorance. He pushed their sins back for a year. They weren't forgiven. They weren't any more holy. But because they obeyed God, God honored His Word. Till a day when the Son came, and the Son removed sin. What pushed back, not behind his back, as far as the east from the west? No, gone. You know what that means? Never existed. God obliterated it. You can't find any trace of it anymore. But yet, in today's dispensation, not under the law, but under grace, God didn't get rid of the altar. The altar should still be just as much a part of our life as it was their life. And I'm not talking about that thing. That, I'm talking about a place. Again, God's not impressed. Brother Ray did a great job on the altar when the building was put in. Right? And it's a place that people can come and kneel out of convenience so they can have a place to rest their help. In the old building, we didn't have an altar. We had a step that big. Right? This is a blessing. But this is a place that you could come openly and pray. No, your altar is one that you made out of dirt or you made out of stone. You ought to have an altar. You know the thing about wood and, I mean not wood, dirt and stone altars? They got to be maintained. You know what happens when it rains? Dirt moves. Especially if you've stacked it up into a pillar or something. You know what will happen to rocks over time? They start to erode. You don't believe me? Some of y'all's driveways got cracks in it. You know why that is? Because rock's not permanent or concrete or blacktop or anything else. That's why all the roads around here are tore up all the time. And gravel's not either. What happens? It rains. It washes out. You get ruts in it. What are you saying, Brother George? Every time they went to the altar, they had to make it the way that it was the first time. What's dirt a sign of? In the Bible, dirt, the world, what is, that's your flesh. It's easy to come to an altar made of wood. It's hard when that altar has to be made out of the things that God doesn't want in your life no more. They took the dirt, something that they walked on, and they made it into something that God would approve of. An altar. Your life, your flesh, meaning the way that you live, the way that you talk, the way that you walk. Okay, we can go over to James where James says, you know, the man's able to bridle the whole body. We can go and look at the book of Revelation where he says that he made you a king and a priest, a king to rule and reign over this flesh. We can show you that God gave you every tool in the Bible for you to live a life that was pleasing unto him. And he gives us a commandment, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament too, be ye holy for I am holy. You know what God's standard is? Holiness. You know what your altar should be before God? Holiness. That's the standard. You may do your best, but then when holiness is the standard, you start realizing it's not what you can do with that dirt, it's what God can do with that dirt. My best is always going to be short of what God demands. Because yet, I'm not holy. One day I will be. Because that part of me that he's sealed until the day of redemption going to be redeemed one day and meet that new body that he's made for me and then I'll be just like Christ forevermore. But until that day, this flesh needs to be turned into an altar. You know what the purpose of an altar is? An altar is a place where something has already died. Go and study out the process that God gave them for sacrificing. You didn't kill the animal on the altar. You did that away from the altar. Because if anything other than what God said was supposed to touch the altar, touched the altar, it defiled the whole sacrifice. You had to start over again. Go and study that once a year sacrifice with the lamb that was spotless, you know, blameless. The one that they would have to set up and they'd have to examine from, make sure it didn't walk funny, make sure that it didn't have a you know, lazy eye. They'd have to make sure that that was a perfect lamb. Go and study what the priest had to do. He had to change clothes about five times throughout that process. 
each time pre preparing himself, purifying himself to make sure that the sacrifice wasn't defiled. You know what went on the altar? The things that you had prepared to go on to the altar. Your life is just the framework. Your flesh is the vehicle that you use to get to where God wants you to go. But it's our responsibility to make sure that the, the foundation, flesh hadn't run off, caused a cave in where half of the altars gone down. No, Lord, I want my life to be a place where I can do business with you. Things that you prepare, you know what you put on the altar? First off, he says, ye shall make unto me an altar, shall sacrifice there on burnt offerings and thy peace offerings. Not all offerings were for sin. There was an offering for worship. There was an offering for peace. There was an offering for intercession and for supplication. There, were many, there was an offering that if you had a kid, you had to go to the... You know, like Mary and Joseph did when Jesus was born, took two turtle doves, went down to the... Why was that? Because God said so. But there were peace offerings. There was incense that you could burn upon the altar that if you did it according to the way that God said it, there'd be a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord in heaven. Go and study all the things that they were constantly doing once they built Solomon's temple. Inside of it, just to be a blessing unto God, to be a place that God might want to come down and visit. You know, your life ought to be, everything that touches your life ought to be a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. Sometimes you've got to put yourself on top of the altar. Sometimes you've got to lay things down on the altar. Sometimes you've got to pull an Abraham and lay people down on the altar. Say, Lord, these don't mean as much to me as my relationship with you. But just one day, without maintaining that altar, it don't look like an altar no more. Just one day where it's not perfect, anything you put on it isn't going to be acceptable unto God. It takes maintenance. But the thing about stones, what Jesus tell Peter, he said, Thou art Peter, Petros, little, little rock. He said, but upon this rock, referring to himself, I shall build my church. You know what we are? We're just a bunch of dirt, gravel. Right? What's he? He's stone. Okay, he's the rock. He said that preaching of himself, right, he said that he was the stone. Okay, then later on, Peter starts gives up preaching. He says, that stone that, you know, y'all tried to kill and bury, but it got up out of the ground on its own again. You tried to put a stone over the tomb to keep the stone inside of the tomb, but the stone moved the big stone and then came out the stone. I never thought of that until right now, but Bob. The rock was buried in a rock-hewn tomb. They tried to cover it with the rock, and the rock came out the rock and went through the rock. But anyway... Yeah. Think on that for a while, Brother Tommy. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? But the stone, what's that? That's a sign of what God's done. You can rein in your flesh, not because of what you've been able to master or how strong you are, but because of what God's given you. You can make an altar of dirt, an earthen altar. You can compel this flesh to do and to be what it needs to be so that you can do work on top of it. We're not glorifying the altar. The altar's just made out of dirt. But you got to get your flesh lined up and in the right spot so that it can be used and you can build things off of it that God will be satisfied with. If you let your flesh run wild, anything that you try to do for God, it's going to fall and hit the ground. It's not going to be kept up away from the world and the things of the world. I mean, they had to beat off birds and wasp and flies and everything else. Anything touched what was on the altar, it defiled it. If it had fallen off of the altar and hit the ground, it would have defiled it. They'd have to start all over again. So what's the rock? Well, the rock is him. They said that, you know, you build anything on shifting sands. We're not building on an earthen altar. 
That, that's for something that we're doing now. That's for the immediate. When it comes to them sacrifices and those things that God expects to last a while, you know what you put them things on top of? Him. Don't hew it. Don't change what God said. Don't try to pervert who Christ is because then you don't have the stone that was cast aside by the builders. You don't have the chief cornerstone anymore. You've got something that you made. Refer back to gold and silver and God's not impressed with it. He's not impressed with what you can make out of things. What's he impressed with? You obeying what he's already done. What he's already said. What he's set forth. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. But yet when it comes to doing them things that are too great for you to handle, you know where he tells you to put it? It says, come and put it on the rock. Come and put it on the solid rock. The one that was from everlasting to everlasting. The one that said, let there and then everything that was created happened. The one that loved you so much that he went to a place called Golgotha. He laid down on top of a cross after they had just beat him to where he didn't even resemble a man anymore. Then he carried a cross some two miles up the Via Della Rosa. Okay, then he gets to a place, the place of the skull called in Hebrew Golgotha. And he lays down si still silent the whole time like a lamb before the slaughter. You know why he did that? So that you could have a rock to build your life off of. You do realize that when Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth, you know what that earth was made of? It was made of dirt. It was a raised place. The Romans called it Mount Calvary. But what was it? It was a place that God said, that dirt's going right there and it's going to be an altar. It's going to be raised up from the rest of everything else. And what went on that altar that God had made? The sacrifice that God had prepared. Who killed the sacrifice? God did. He gave up the ghost. Who took his life back up? God did. But that was one made out of earth and dirt. Why? Because that's what God said for the old. But when it comes to stone, what's that? That's permanent. We can't be, by definition, we are impermanent. The moment we took our first breath was one step closer to taking our last breath. Nothing about us is ever like he had to make our soul saved forevermore right? the only thing everlasting about us was the soul that God gave us it's going to spend all of eternity in one or two places heaven or hell that wasn't because of something we did that's because man breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life and man became a living soul God gave to you the only thing about you that's permanent but he says, if you build it out of stone, don't knock the edges off of it. There's nothing you can do to improve the stone that God's already done. But you say, well, it doesn't look very sturdy. They've been saying that for thousands of years. Guess what? It's still just as sturdy as it's ever been. You say, well, that, that old ship is iron. It doesn't look seaworthy. Oh, it's been battered and it's been bruised, but I promise you this, it's going to keep on sailing until God calls it home. You say, that stone doesn't look like it can weather a storm. I promise you this, that stone's withstood everything that hell could throw at it, everything that man could throw at it, and it's laughed in the face of all of it because it's God. You can put things on that stone and you can consider it settled. What are those things that you put on a stone altar? The ones that have to be there for a while. Them's your prayers. You want a loved one safe? Don't put that on dirt. I've got days where I'm not enough to win people. On my best day, I'm not enough to be a, a good representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Holy Ghost is the one that convicts them. I'm not good enough. I'm just a guy holding a sign saying, Jesus, that way. But in all truth, you know what? We're not, he said, ye are the light of the world. You know why that is? Because he shines through us. We're just mirrors that we got to keep polished up so that when people look at us, they're redirected to look at Him. If they see me, they're not going to be impressed. I just got to get me out the way and keep the dirt off of it. Why? So that they can see the one that is altogether lovely. The one that said, taste and see. Why? Because He knew it'd be good. 
What are we supposed to be? We're just ambassadors. It's not about me. But those things that I care about that I know are too big for me, I don't want that on dirt. I don't want that to where the wind can reach it, where the rains can come and sweep it away. No, Lord, I'm entrusting this to you. You know what's on that rock? Your future's on that rock. You can build your future on your own. I've seen that go sideways too many times. And it seems like every time it's happening now, it just keeps happening faster and faster and faster. You know what's on that rock? Your kids are on that rock. They better be on that rock. Because if you let them stand on anything else, it's not going to last. It's going to disappoint them. It's going to leave them with more questions than answers. But that altar that's made out of stone, you do realize because of the sacrifice that Christ made, and because he is now our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that we can enter directly into the throne room of God and pray to God. We don't have to go through anybody else. You know what that means? Not only is he the altar, he's the one taking it from the altar and giving it to God. When God takes what you've given to him and gives it to God, don't you think it's safe? I mean, you're in his hand and his hand's in the Father's hand. When both of them got their hands on whatever you lay down to him, he's going to keep it. They gave him a dried out reed when they were punching and beating him in the hall of praetorium. And because it was testified that anything that was entrusted to him, that he'd care for it, he'd keep it the way that it was given to him, it says that they took the reed from him. You ever try holding a dry, dried out piece of grass? You blow on it too hard and it's going to crack or it's going to crumble. But yet while they were inflicting the most horrific pain that we can imagine upon him, and as the weight of all the sin of the world, past, present, and future was laid upon him as much as his flesh wanted to recoil in pain he kept that reed and it didn't crumble so you're really telling me that he can't handle your life he can't handle the cares that you have that he's not strong enough or he's not able to bring about those things that are too great for you you should be on the rock but all those cares that you have, if they're anywhere but the rock, it's not going to turn out the way that it could have. It may still end up good, but I promise you this, he does all things well. His ways are above our ways. Even if by chance God winks at us and still chooses to bless, I promise you this, it's going to be sweeter if it was just on the rock the whole time. He said, what needs to be on the rock? Whatever God says needs to be on the rock. He's your high priest, not me. Well, what needs to be on that earthen altar? Well, I know that he said that we were supposed to live like Christ. You can't do that if your flesh is running around all cattywampus. Right? If it's crumbling, you can't go out and do anything that's going to be of permanence towards God. But he's saying, there's still altars that we need to use today. Too many people are afraid to draw near. They want to stand afar off. They want to look at the altars. No, you got to get up close to an altar to put something on it. And you may have to go through darkness and thickness in order to get to the altar that God wants you to get to. But I promise you this, it'll be worth it. Because you know who's waiting for you? He says everywhere his name is recorded. You know what that means? Wherever God is, as long as there's an altar there, he'll come down and he'll do business with you there. Well, you're going to an altar that is God, and God promised to meet you at the altar, and God's the one that gave you the altar. Why? So you can do business with God. God's all about your altar. The question is, is whether or not we want to go through what it takes to get to that altar, to where we can start doing some business with God. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.